Welcome back to another video. In this video, I'm going to show how I built the biggest conference table I've ever seen. I was really excited to take on this one. When I found out how big this lab was, it did present some challenges. So this lab we're going to be working with is 16 feet long and over four feet wide, which presents challenges when it comes to flattening the thing. At the time, I lived in Jackson, Mississippi, and this table was going to be the conference table for the Department of Agriculture in Mississippi. I called all around to cabinet shops and places who had large sanders and giant CNC's and no one was either willing to give me time or had the equipment available to flatten this. So I turned to my buddy Brent, he makes router flattening sleds and I asked him if we could make a custom one to flatten this slab basically in place and he was like, yeah, let's do it. So Brent and I went and grabbed a bunch of materials and here you've been seeing us just spending some time breaking down some MDF and making a platform so that this slab could sit on it and the rails would be on either side. So we built this platform in place, the slab will end up on top of it and then we will go to town flattening this thing. So thanks for checking out this video. Keep watching to see how this massive conference table turns out. I'll have links below to some of Brent's information. If you wanna grab a cool router sled that he makes, he's got some standard sizes, but as you can see, he can build one pretty much custom to anything that you need. So definitely check out his information. One of the most difficult things about building this platform in place is this is an incredibly old building and we're basically building in a driveway. So it was sloped kind of to one side and one corner, but it's where we had to build it. So we did a lot of shimming and used levels to really make sure that our platform was as level and square as it could be. Brent and I were barely able to get this slab up onto the platform. The platform was not very tall, but we used a couple of ratchet straps kind of around our arms like you would lift furniture and we were able to get it up there. Then it was a matter of just kind of finding the high spots like you do when you're flattening something and starting on that high corner and kind of going back and forth until you can take a bigger and bigger bite out of the slab. Oh, and be sure to stick around to the end of the video. You'll get to see the agriculture commissioner's reaction to this video. He authorized it and we stayed within the budget that they had, but this was done as a surprise and he did not know what the product looked like. This slab was about three inches thick and had a significant twist to it. So there was a lot of work to be done on two of the corners to kind of get them more in line with the rest of the slab. But we just worked our way down starting in that corner and then gradually moved on and on and on. The bit we were using was a carbide flattening bit and I think it was about an inch and a half wide. It's not totally ideal to have a bit that small when you're trying to cover such a large span of a piece of wood like this. That's why I was trying to find somebody with a CNC or a wide belt sander or somebody that could make much quicker work of this. Uh, it got the job done, but obviously an inch and a half pass over multiple depths across this four plus foot wide, you know, 16 foot long table, it took a while. One thing we really watched out for, and you wanna make sure if you're doing the same thing, is to not put too much down pressure in the middle of this sled. You'll cause deflection and the bit will actually dig in a little bit more than it will in other places. You want to try to just let the sled do the pushing. Don't force anything, don't go too fast with your router because all of that will just cause more sanding. Obviously it depends on the customer, but with a lot of slabs, you wanna to try to leave it as thick as possible. This is the underside that we've been flattening here. 
and we did not get everything just perfectly flat. We got all of the places that would reference the base. It's gonna have a huge steel base on it. All of those spots were flat and the rest of it, we decided to not take off any more thickness because you would never know. Brent and I had a hard enough time putting this slab on our platform the first time. We were really worried about destroying the platform, throwing it out of square after we had spent a long time building it. So we recruited some help. We got some people that were on the grounds to come and help us so that we could wrangle this thing a little bit easier. It was at this point that we realized our platform was a little bit too tall. By the time we had removed some of the material on the back side, our router bit would not extend far enough to reach what we needed to reach. So we decided to cut a few shims, reference those flat points on the back of the slab before we set it back down to do the top side. Just like on the bottom side, there was one corner that was really twisted and out of whack. So we kind of had to work on it down at one end before we could start doing more full length passes. But you can start to see we're revealing new wood. We're getting down to a really nice platform. And man, this Sapili is so pretty. And yeah, I don't think I had even said that yet. This is Sapili. It is related to mahogany and it came from South America. The sad time came for Brent to have to go home. He's from New Orleans, so he came up for actually a day longer than he had planned to to help me with this. I really appreciate it, Brent. Thanks so much for the help. Now it was time for me to do the rest of the back breaking work. I'm tall, so leaning over here to the ground was just a wreck on my back, but I just had to keep going back and forth, back and forth, making passes. As you can see, there are a couple really large gouges or something from the milling process in the top of this board. So I had to keep going down until I got all of that removed. And that concludes the flattening chapter of this story. Days later, here you see the table is sitting up much higher. I recruited some help and did not film it, but we've got this thing up on some really heavy duty saw horses so I can continue to flatten it, get some of the ridges out that the router left, and then just start the task of sanding. Before I started sanding though, I just used a hand plane. There were quite a few ridges that were left from the router. I don't know if it was just my fatigue and maybe I was pushing down on the router sled more, but I'm sure it was user error. The hand plane helped me knock off some of those higher ridges using it kind of like a scrub plane and then I moved on to the sander. I think in total I sanded for about 15 hours on this project. I started with a pretty aggressive grit. Like I said, I had some lines and grooves probably from fatigue on my part, but I started with 40 grit which is really aggressive, but I knew I was working my way up through the grits anyway. Went to 80 after that, 120 grit, and then I started working on the edges. For the edge, there was a decent amount of cleanup necessary. I used a series of tools on this. I used a draw knife to kind of get pieces of bark and broken pieces off. I use a painter's five point tool that works pretty well to just kind of clean up rough edges and different things. And then I would come back with a Shinto rasp to kind of shape the edge more like what I wanted. People's arms are going to be sitting on this thing as a conference table and I didn't want a sharp edge. I used a sander that had a more flexible pad so that it could kind of contour that edge a little bit more. Time to clean up the ends. Both ends had some splitting from the drying process, so I wanted to trim those off, make them look a little bit nicer, but still leave as much length as possible. I used my track saw for this. My blade was not quite enough to get all the way through on this end, and I just used a handsaw to finish the cut. Then I just repeated on the other end.
And here I am back working on the edge. It seems like I'm jumping around probably, but there were multiple times when I would just look at this piece and go, mm, you know, this spot needs a little bit more work. And it was a very fluid thing. So I just kept looking at it and I would go back to working the edge with the Shinto rasp or the sander as I saw fit. I don't know the full history of this slab, but it had a lot of cracks and dirt and grime and stuff that I wanted to remove as much as possible. So I have these small picks that I use for cleaning up laser engravings and different stuff. They were perfect for cleaning out the cracks so that it would not look grimy. Now it was time for the task of filling in the voids on the top. There were lots of little cracks and pinholes. I don't know if they were from the drying process or what, but for most of the little tiny holes, I just used some black CA glue and some accelerator to fill those tiny holes and then sand them back. For the larger holes and cracks, there were some stress cracks on the side from the drying process. I just used some epoxy with some black pigment in it and just taped up the side so it wouldn't run anywhere as well as the bottom and filled those in. If you're looking to pick up some of this CA glue, I use Starbond and the stuff works great. I almost always use the medium black CA glue from them. I'll have a link below. Uh, it is an affiliate link, but you can get a discount on it as well if you use the code Bruce A. Ulrich at checkout. I just used a small dental syringe to get the epoxy down into all of the stress cracks and holes. And then I just left for the day to let all of that set up. Just like with any void filling, you're not gonna get it perfect the first time. You're probably gonna have to come back and top off some of these cracks and holes. So just know that you're gonna have a few applications. It's finally time to add some finish and see this beautiful sapili wood really come to life. For the initial finish and a pour sealer, I'm using Armor Seal from General Finishes. I'm just brushing it on and honestly in hindsight, if I were to do this again, I would wipe it on. I was not really happy with the different lines that any overlap left when I would brush it on. I was able to get that to feather out with some sanding and different applications, but I think I caused a lot more work for myself by doing that. I think if I wiped it on and was really careful about very thin coats, it would have been more controlled. Armor Seal does have some resins in it that amber the wood just a little bit, but that's what the client wanted and that's what I wanted for this table to really bring out that deep kind of rusty color in the Sapili. As yet another day comes to a close working on this project, you can see how my overlapping lines show just a little bit. As that first coat of finish was drying on the top, I switched gears and went to my shop. I cut out a piece of acrylic and threw it in the laser so that I could make a quick bow tie template. I actually sell these on my website, so if you want to pick up one of these, I've changed the style just a little bit because the shipping companies kept breaking them, so now they're even better than what you're seeing, but they work great. The general premise is you use a router inlay kit. This kit is from Whiteside. I can link it below, but it has a little bushing that you do all of your routing on your actual workpiece to create the mortise. And then you use the same thing, but remove the little bushing to route out your bow ties. You can see I've already created the bow ties. I did that back in my shop before I got to this facility, but you just go all around cleaning out all of the waste. And then sometimes you actually have to come back with a chisel or something just to clean up the bottom to make sure that you got everything nice and flat. I did a full video dedicated to using this inlay kit, so if you want to see more information about how that's done, 
I'll put a link up in the top right of your screen and down in the description. Go check out that video. It's really short, but it shows you how to use this inlay kit and it works really well. Because this inlay kit uses a router and routers have round bits, your corners are going to be round in your mortise. It's able to go around the outside and leave square corners on your actual inlay. So you just need to take a piece of sandpaper and just barely scuff the edges to where they're not perfectly sharp and they're a little bit rounded and it's a perfect fit. Then I just added some glue and tapped it in to make sure it was secure before using another piece of wood to drive it home. But wait, haven't I already applied finish? And why am I cutting into the top after applying finish to the top? Well, that's a good question. I had to do things a little bit out of order on this project, mostly because it was so big, I had to get help to turn it over and help was not always available. I was doing this on the grounds of the agriculture department and it was up to when someone was available to help me flip this thing over. So I did put some finish on the top because I didn't want to waste time and I had the chance to do it. Then I inlaid these bow ties and yes, I'm going to end up scuffing it up and having to come back and add some finish. But sometimes you just have to roll with things even if they're not quite in the correct order so that you can get the project done. After I sanded the bow ties flush, I had to add a little bit more of that armor seal back to it just to make it look like the rest of it. Like I said, brushing it on left some lines where it overlapped, but I was able to get that to feather in nicely. Before adding my top coats, I sanded back the armor seal with some 400 grit sandpaper just to remove any little nibs and high spots that were left from adding that finish. For more even application, I'm spraying on the top coat and I'm using a conversion varnish that's also made by General Finishes. This is a very hard finish, very durable finish, and this conference table is going to see a lot of use and wear over the years. So I wanted to make sure it was up for the task. I ended up applying a total of four coats and I would scuff in between with a brown paper bag. I added my maker's mark and signed the year that I made it. The facility I was doing all of the work in was about a half a mile away from the building where it would ultimately live. So we had the nerve wracking job of transporting this thing on a flatbed truck all the way to the conference room. This is the huge room that will be the home to the new conference table. Luckily it was on the first floor, but it was up a full flight of stairs and that was difficult carrying it up. This massive steel base was fabricated in pieces because it weighed so much, but it was made to bolt together in place. So we set the tabletop upside down, put the table base together so that we could mark all of the spots for the threaded inserts.
I pre-drilled all of the holes that I marked previously. That way we could put the threaded inserts in there. We had a little bit of trouble because this wood is really dense and I forgot to bring any wax or anything, but we were able to scrounge up a candle that somebody had in the building and we used that on the threaded inserts to make sure that they went in just fine. Then it was just a matter of flipping the tabletop over and setting it on the table base and using some washer head bolts to secure the tabletop to the threaded inserts. The holes in the steel base are drilled slightly larger than the furniture bolts. That way we can account for wood movement over the years. It's definitely the largest conference table I've ever seen and it's the biggest project I've ever made. I really like the finishing touches of the bow ties and those stress fractures that I filled. All of it adds to just a really unique conference table. That custom base really tops it off and there is zero sag in the middle due to his design. He designed it to look like one of those old truss style railroad bridges and I think he nailed it. This conference table comfortably sits 16 different people and I think that's pretty impressive. It's cool for me to know that so many of their meetings will be conducted around this table, as well as all of their press conferences recorded right at this table. Big thanks to Larry over at Hartwood. He provided the slab and got me involved in this project. Big thanks to Mike. He fabricated the base and showed me his shop and all the cool stuff that he does. I love collaborating with awesome people and these are definitely awesome people. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Be sure to get subscribed to the channel because I've got some more cool projects coming up and I'll see you on the next video. Hey, whoa! Hey. Oh man, this is fantastic. Well, that is genuine Mississippi. Thank y'all. Y'all growing it yourself. Man alive, this is not. Now, work, tell me the story on these pieces. Good gracious. This thing is from South America, somewhere. It's uh, it's called sapili. It's related to mahogany. So, it's a single piece from a tree. This isn't jointed together or anything, and it. Uh, from one tree. From one tree. That's one single slab. This is nice.